Mr. President, what happened? Why did you decide to leave the ECOWAS? Thank you. As you say, this is a topical question. This decision of the AES to withdraw from ECOWAS took place last Sunday. It is not a matter of turning one's back on an organization, but it is the result of a deep analysis. I think that this organization was born in 1975, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, in 1975. With heads of state, for the most part, military. In any case, as far as the IAS is concerned, they were all military. I think it was a desire to integrate the people, to expand the economy, Solidarity, in any case the virtues of Pan-Africanism, which led the heads of state to create this organization. Unfortunately, over time, the organization lost its values. Today, the observation is clear. I think that for more than a decade, the republics of Mali and Niger are at war with terrorism. And in Burkina Faso, almost a decade from now, we are at war. This organization, which was supposed to create solidarity, we have never received any help from this organization. No solidarity, no logistics, no compassion. Mr. Poisson, we understand that recently the relations have been particularly difficult. With what has happened, the coup d'etat that took place in the different states you just mentioned, Mali, Nigeria and Burkina Faso, you want to leave. And people ask themselves, isn't it a reaction to the fact that they don't accept that you allowed the coup d'etat, that you are leaving and that you say, well, since they don't accept it, we're leaving. The coups, we don't do it because we want to. It is this way of seeing things that must be changed. Do you agree with me that, first of all, it was a crisis to make a coup d'etat and assume its responsibilities is very heavy. But if we do it, it is because we want to bring our people to a certain level of sovereignty. Because we know the origin of this crisis, I think we should be accompanied. People are proud of the cities. There are so many millions of displaced people in these countries. But what do you do to help them? Nothing. Do you feel that it is the military who are more likely to solve these problems than the politicians, the civilians? Is that your feeling? Everyone could do it. But how do you explain that it is the military who take the lead and say, we don't want civilians anymore? No. The military didn't tell me that we don't want civilians anymore. It is by duty of patriotism. When the nation is in peril, at a given moment, it is necessary to make important decisions. If it turns out that it is the military who have the courage to make these decisions, well, that's what it is. Anyway, civilians or military, we are all the children of this country. And anyone who has the feeling of being able to free his country, he can do it. So it's not a question of the military, where the military has succeeded. Here too, the military can succeed. So, Mr. President, what do you say to the heads of the eco was who say they feel good because we said we don't want putschists among us. There are a lot of putschists among them. So it's not a question of putschists, it's just a mask. When you say putschists, do you mean civilians? There are military putschists within the ECOWAS who today claim to be Democrats. There are civilians, there are worse than putschists. There are those who kill, who slaughter their people in silence. The ECOWAS closes its eyes and ears. There are a lot of putschists within the ECOWAS. So, Mr. President says, okay, we leave the ECOWAS with immediate effect, Burkina Faso, Nigeria and Mali. We leave with immediate effect, but Mr. President, it concerns a lot of people. What do we do about the depopulation of people, of your populations who are in these countries, of the ECOWAS that you leave overnight? How is it going to happen exactly? Because the texts say, it takes at least a year to be able to implement all this. So there you say, no, it's over now. Yes. First of all, you say the texts say, but they themselves have never respected their texts. It's done on the client's behalf. That's what we've noticed. The sanctions imposed on Nigeria don't exist anywhere in the texts. So the first to violate these texts are these so-called Democrats. We leave, but we don't stay in African. Anyone in Africa, an African who wants to come to Burkina, 
he is welcome at home. But in the opposite direction, it's going to be complicated. Someone who is within the AES, we'll talk about the AES in a moment. Someone who is within the AES, we can tell him he can't go to Burkina, he can't go to Ivory Coast. It becomes a little more complicated for those who do their business there. Is this departure of the ECO was well thought out, Mr. President? Of course, very well thought out. It's not a stroke of the heart. It's not a stroke of anger. If it was a stroke of anger, we would have done it a long time ago. I think we took the time to analyze the situation, to weigh a lot of things, and finally to decide. So if it was a stroke of the heart from the first moment of certain sanctions, the people were quite resilient, it must be said. They suffered. So during that time, we could decide in anger. Now we have more time to observe, to analyze the situation and to convince ourselves of our strengths before deciding. And you took everyone by surprise. Another element in this new way of drawing the fruit of the West, the AES, the Alliance of States of the Sahel. Mr. President, is the AES viable? On paper, it's very, very appealing. But is it viable? You know very well that it's more than viable. You know, for a long time, we have maintained our people in a certain philosophy, while always making us believe that we can do nothing without others. Today, our mission is to raise awareness. We must be able to raise awareness so that young people realize who is at home. For an organization like this, you must first realize its strengths, weigh its weaknesses, and at the end of this analysis, you decide. The AES is very well viable. Mr. President, if I may, these are very integrated economies. You produce the same thing, you do exactly the same thing. Who will sell to whom? How will it trade? And what do we do? The numbers are one thing. The economy, too. You know, we have been here for a very short time, but the economy has been, I would say, a little torn apart by past regimes. Otherwise, we should have very strong economies today. That's what I'm saying. By analyzing our strengths, we realize that we should not be at this stage. We should be much further. When you take the AES in terms of population, in terms of surface area, we are doing very well. In terms of production, normally the states of the AES did not give any importance to agricultural products, to food. Today, we are aware of this, and we are doing everything so that we do not give any importance to what concerns what we consume. In terms of wealth, whether it is natural, when I say natural wealth, there is underground wealth, but there is also on the surface. We shout everywhere that Africans are dying of hunger, of thirst, and so on. Projects invented here and there, for example, to give us drinking water. The AES is a large underground reserve, and even on the surface. In terms of mineral resources, we have nothing to envy to anyone. And in nature, when you take products, as I like to say, charity, it is a natural wealth. We did not plant it. It is God who gave it, but it is very rich. People take it and transform it. So we are aware of our potential. The AES has nothing to envy to anyone. For you, the AES can be enough to be an integrated set that works normally, perfectly. Mr. President, when we look at the approach that has just been undertaken by these three states, very concretely, we hear everywhere that there is a need that they are working with others on a subject that is the most important today, security. I want to ask you, Mr. President, you have been here for a while now, more than a year. What is your assessment in the field of security? Before we talk about these three states in terms of security, in your case, in Burkina Faso, a good part of the territory is still in the hands of terrorists. What have you been able to do since you have been here, in this area? Very well. It is the priority, in fact, for us. As you said, 
It is terrorists. It is killing, burning, moving populations, taking land. But I can tell you, at the moment, as I said recently, there is not a certain portion of the territory where we want to go and where we cannot go. Today, you are going to the whole territory, everywhere. Territories that were under control, if we can say so, for three or four years. Let's say that. But we are talking about more attacks than when there were foreign armies on the territory. Yes, you are sure. More attacks is relative. Today we are on the offensive for most areas. We are no longer in a position on the defense. We are going to the enemy. We are looking for the enemy. When we decided to take our destiny, as we would say, it was a rather important decision and very brave. And when you decide like that, all the dormant cells wake up all of a sudden. And it is at this moment that you realize the magnitude of the terrorism situation. We realized it well. But to make war, there is first patriotism. There is logistics. And now, there is the intelligence of the situation. Patriotism is awakened in all Burkina Faso, whether it is the fighters, whether it is the civilian population, they see them contributing. It would not have been possible a few years ago. Why? We must be able to awaken patriotism in each people, to trust them, to know that their country is the only thing they have left. We managed to do that. That is why when we ask them to contribute, they do it. We ask people to get involved to fight everywhere they are. Even today, if we decide that we want one million Burkina Faso people to fight, we have them. Volunteers for the defense of their country? Yes. People are ready, they are engaged. It is not dangerous for them? No. It is their country. It is their country. Everywhere in the world, people fought for their country. Mr. President, when we say that, we want to ask ourselves the question of knowing if terrorism has been going on for a while already in our territories, with armies coming and extraordinary sums of money, quality military arsenal. How do you explain that all of a sudden you decide that all three of you will fight this without the others? Is it realistic? What makes it possible today than with these armies that were there? It is more than realistic. There have been several situations we had the chance to do the field. Many other officers that you may meet had the chance to do the field. And we were operating with these foreign armies. In your own territory, you are being restricted. They do what they want. What is even more surprising, imagine with all the technology they had. They currently have satellites that observe everything. They had drones, helicopters, all kinds of devices. But we never saw the terrorists. Today, we decided to go to war. Do you realize that we meet them every day and we whip them? So, there is a problem. For you, there was no real desire to fight them. No desire to fight them. If they wanted, they could do it. The terrorists would never have reached this level. Today, we say, if they get results, if they get some results, it is because they have the Russians with them. There was Wagner, who we talked about. Today, we even have the Russians who opened their first military base with Africa Corps. Mr. President, do the Russians help you? Is their help better than that of the foreign armies that were there? You know, as far as Burkina is concerned, we have always been in a relationship with Russia. And I tell you, 80% of Burkina's equipment was Russian equipment. Really? Of course. But you had a stronger military contact with the French. How do you explain that? Because these equipment date from the years of the revolution. Of course. We have equipment from the years of the revolution that still fights. Russian and Korean equipment, North Korean, that still fights in our army. And in the meantime, are they more effective? The army has been abandoned. Don't forget that. Since the 90s, with the so-called structural management program, everything has been denatured. There are soldiers who went up to the guard with sticks. We disarmed the army, our armies. It was well prepared. No more equipment, 
no more training, nothing. People were just wearing uniform, and terrorism is inviting itself to the dance a few years later, and it's singing in all the media. They are unable to fight. We will come to help them, and terrorism is only gaining ground. Today with Russia, the relationship is first of all strategic. I think you understand that much better than we do. And with Russia, there is no equipment that we want to pay with them, that they don't sell. The others make us restrictions, and they tell you, you can't buy this type of weapon. Of course. But the Russians sell you everything you want. Everything we want. Until the moment I speak to you, we are blocked from licenses for certain planes. There are weapons, types of weapons, that they will never sell to us. And how do they explain these restrictions to you? Every time I ask the question, where is the friendship? What do they want? There are many countries, Russia, China, Turkey, Korea, and so on. There are no restrictions. With Iran, Everything we want, they will give us the point. If we can pay, we pay. But with these states that were there, our friends, there are restrictions. There are even some who have come to tell us that they can't sell us anything, that there is lethal. Oh, yes? Yes. So you're at war, you can't kill the one in front of you. Terrorists kill us, but we may have the duty to pick up stones. Maybe even the stones are lethal. Everything that is lethal, they don't sell to us. That's their principle. So today, with Russia, what do they take back? We know that there is no friendship between the states. It's always interests. Everyone comes for their interests. So today, there is the fear of a certain number of people to see that we have changed a master for another. Now, I know you a little bit to know that you are not in the replacement of a master by another. What do you give to the Russians very concretely for them to be there? Do they take the ore? How do you pay them? Are you selling a portion of the territory? What is the deal? If that's the deal, to really leave a master for another, we prefer to die. Because when we say the country or death, it has all its meaning. No, it's just media lies again. And unfortunately, we had even seen heats of state who fell into it, who told them lies, saying that we gave minis to the Russians in our part of the South. It's a lie. There is nothing given to the Russians. It's a lie. Not even a mine. Why give? If the Russians want a mine, we have the mining code. They come to integrate into it. We give them the permit. They pay the taxes, and they do everything they have to do, like the others. But with what do you pay the Russians? They don't come for you. Ah, yes. With what do we pay them? First of all, the Russians came when in Burkina Faso. It was the last time that instructors came because they had to come and instruct the military on equipment. And it's with all the countries. It's not just the Russians. When we sign a contract to acquire equipment, we sign the contract with the training. There are a lot of Turks here. Why don't they talk about it? They are specialized in drones. We paid drones with the Turks with an assistance contract more than a year ago. All the time we are here, there are Turks here. Why don't we talk about it? They support us. They trained our crews in Turkey. They come here, they assist them, and they continue to train them in piloting, maintenance and everything. We have the contract on a given time. When our men are well trained, they will leave. The Chinese, they are here. The equipment we pay from China, they are here too, to train and to manipulate these equipment. That's the reality. Are they on the ground or not, the Russians? On the ground to fight? No, there are no Russians on the ground to fight. These are things developed in people's minds. But if there is a need, they will come on the ground to fight. I can assure you that. If there is a need, you don't forbid it? No. Except that for now they are not on the ground. No, for now we fight alone. They support us in terms of training, on logistics, tactical training and everything, and they support us in this area. Mm. 